right, good evening, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, as we have additional folks come in, please, there are definitely still seats. Um, thank you all for taking time out of what is a tremendously beautiful afternoon and evening uh, to come out tonight. For those of you who I don't know, my name is Julia Kowalski. I'm a Collingswood resident, mom to a middle schooler, and I teach at Collingswood Middle School in Fairfield and Starfield. Uh, by day, I'm the chief strategy officer at Philadelphia Youth Basketball. I started my career as a teacher, science teacher in Philadelphia, uh, and then as a teacher coach. Uh, I have facilitation experience, and uh, I'm certified in the sanctuary model, which is a trauma-informed organizational framework. I volunteered my time tonight to facilitate the Q&A session um, to make sure the folks around the table uh, had the time and, and thought for their answers as well. I'm going to run through a couple of items for tonight uh, around the purpose of the evening, share details on the format, um, and we'll then pass it over um, to the folks up front. So the purpose of our time tonight is really to allow the board to respond to submitted FAQs and answer live questions this evening uh, to support the community's understanding of the referendum that was proposed at the special board meeting presentation on March 26th. Uh, I want to note that not every question asked in the FAQ will be directly answered, um, but the board will answer the most kind of comprehensive themes to provide as much clarity as possible. Um, additionally, we are live streaming this evening, um, and the recording will be uploaded uh, after we've concluded. Um, the uh, last Q&A session, which was on April 9th, you to be interested in revisiting. So to achieve our outcome for the night, the board will first share um, updates and answers to some of the questions that have come in since the last Q&A on the 9th and um, this evening. Um, so thank you to everyone who submitted additional questions um, and is here tonight to help ask additional questions. Uh, following uh, their answers to those questions received ahead of time, we'll open um, to the audience to ask questions. To maximize our time, we're going to ask everyone to, to have a prepared question. So unlike public comment at an official board meeting, we ask that you reserve your personal thoughts and opinions in, in favor of asking that question so we can get through um, as many as possible. I do want to note um, that the next board meeting is on Monday, April 29th, where you will absolutely be able to share those personal thoughts and opinions. Um, and I will, if needed, politely ask folks to kind of get to their question or proceed on to the direction of the question. Last thing before we get started, I would really like to introduce some community things. When we come together as a town, we have a real opportunity to engage in productive dialogue. As a former teacher and a current leader who works on behalf of young people every day, we really can serve as a model of what positive civic engagement looks like. Um, and I offer kind of the following agreements as a foundation for tonight's uh, so the first would be respect. We understand these topics are deeply personable, personal and important to individuals in our community. We seek to learn from one another and treat each other with respect and civility. Empathy. We recognize that this proposal contains changes that elicit a heightened emotional response. We honor that and recognize that on both ends. Curiosity. So we engage as learners and we're recognizing the time and thought that went into this proposal while also acknowledging the perspectives that it may be shared. We ask questions and seek to understand. Uh, and evolution. Our goal tonight is going to be to answer as many questions uh, that were asked and that are asked live tonight. Uh, 90 minutes will likely not um, suffice for that. But please know that this process is evolutionary and there will be more opportunities uh, for engagement. And we'll make sure we outline that. Again, I would ask that you listen, process, answer, and respond using the sentiment of those community agreements. Uh, you will hear me using the language throughout the evening. I also have the role of asking folks to wrap up or move on and so forth. Um, so I appreciate your grace as I try to manage our time tonight. Um, with that, I'm going to ask the folks uh, at the tables up front if they'll quickly introduce themselves. Um, and then I will hand it over to Dr. Rochelle. Start over here. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew Craig, I am the chair.
chair of the Finance Governance Group Roundtable. Roger Chu, I'm the chair of the Curriculum Committee. Uh, I'm Christine Celia, I'm the chair of the Personnel Committee, and I also sit on the Finance Governance Group Roundtable. Bruce Smith, I'm the chair of the DEI Committee. Kate Seltzer, I'm Vice President of the Board. Reagan Cade, I'm President of the Board. So good evening, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for being here. Um, before we dig into uh, the referendum proposal, I would be remiss if we did not um, discuss uh, what has transpired uh, in the media uh, as well as in, uh, in our schools uh, over the last several weeks. And so uh, we are uh, fully aware of what the media is reporting with regards to the racial bias incident that took place prior to spring break. Uh, allegedly involving a group of students at our high school. Uh, it is also important to note that the information that has been released within the media uh, was attained on their own and was not provided by members of the district or members of the high school itself. Uh, and so I believe that it's important for us to be able to talk about these items um, as they happen, uh, but we also want to be very mindful that uh, because we are dealing with uh, young people, um, the school is currently conducting an active uh, harassment, intimidation, and bullying investigation, which is private and confidential by state law. In addition, um, we cannot nor will we comment on any potential legal proceedings or any law enforcement involvement that may or may not take place, as that is also uh, confidential uh, with the privacy of the underage uh, individuals involved. Uh, but we will also uh, uh, say that any uh, young person uh, within our school system found to be in direct violation of our district code of conduct or harassment, intimidation, or bullying policies will be disciplined appropriately. And so as a Collingswood resident, um, as a school district parent of two small children and your superintendent, I do find the incidents uh, reported deeply troubling. Um, it speaks to the multi-generational cultural challenges that we continue to experience in our community for many, many years. And so as a school community, we have made significant progress in the areas of social justice and equity. However, we still have a lot of work left to do if we're going to deliver on our robust promise to educate all students uh, and respect all students within our schools. And so it's also important to note that the pursuit of social justice and equity is very complex because it, it affects multiple facets, including policies, practices, as well as people. So as part of our strategic plan, we seek further integration of diversity, equity, and inclusion concepts into our district culture by dismantling the negative stigmas connected between our school communities, by prioritizing um, sustainable pathways to increase the diversity of our faculty and our staff, as well as building and developing the cultural competencies of our administrative team as well as our uh, classroom teachers. And so the road to progress is a long one. Um, and it is definitely worthwhile. So the Board of Education, as well as the school district, reject all forms of racism, as they are contradictory to our mission, vision, and values. We're also committed to preparing all students for the economic diversity represented throughout every school and throughout our entire community. And so all members of our school system deserve a safe, respectful, and welcoming and inclusive environment in which their uniqueness is recognized and valued. And so we are committed to the dismantling of, of all of these challenges uh, and building capacity to empower students to be their best selves. And so this topic will not be part of our community session today. However, it is intimately connected to the goals and objectives that we're seeking to achieve through this referendum proposal. Uh, so I'd like to thank you. Let's return the mic on. Um, now we're going to address uh, some of the FAQs that came up uh, before we turn it over to the live audience. Um, thank you, Julia. I, I did just want to say um, we, as a board, um, believe that community conversations about um, race and how we come together as a community to, to address these issues are important. We didn't feel that 
conflating the two things was, in, was appropriate for tonight. We feel that that deserves its own separate space. Um, so we'll be, be on the lookout for, for those opportunities and when that will be happening in the future. Um, but tonight we're going to focus on what we, we had already planned to focus on, which is our second info session about um, the proposed bond referendum. So my, um, my task right now is to give a broad overview of where, uh, of the, um, the proposal itself and try to, um, in doing that, answer some of the, the questions that have come up for folks. Um, so just first to, to remind everyone that if you'd like a detailed um, explanation of the proposal, you can find that on the website, um, both in a PDF document and the, the presentation that was given by Mr. Craig and uh, Mr. Garrison at the special board meeting on March 26th. Okay. So I think it is important to start with defining the problem that we're trying to solve for with this referendum, um, which is facilities needs. Um, so the problem that has been um, the reason that we've had a facilities ad hoc committee for quite some time now that we are trying to solve for is our facilities needs. And um, we, you know, we, know, we have known for quite some time we have aging facilities in this district that are becoming more and more costly to maintain both the buildings themselves and our field space as well. So when an opportunity to uh, address or begin to address, I should say, uh, our aging facilities arose with the potential to buy Good Shepherd, that is where uh, further conversations started um, when it comes to facilities. Because before that opportunity arose, there, there wasn't a real feasible way for us to uh, be able to tackle some of these um, Um, buying Good Shepherd came up. We wanted to look into what would be required in order to do that. We fully uh, recognize that it does not solve all of our facilities issues, but it does take us quite a few steps forward in beginning to address them. So this is the, the beginning of, of addressing the facilities needs plan, not the end. The Good Shepherd building itself would be the youngest building in our district and the largest elementary school. It would allow the district much more flexibility with space for students than we currently have right now. In order to obtain Good Shepherd, and, and this, is, this can get uh, a little co confused, and so I want to try to be as clear as possible here. Um, since our goal is to try to address some of our facilities needs, and this school has become available, um, we asked our uh, architect and engineer to help us um, determine what is required by the state in order for us to obtain it. And the state requires that the district show a need that is more technical than, we'd love this to have more space, and so we'd love to buy this building. Um, so we must show that without it, we would not have classroom space for close to the number of students that the building we are trying to acquire can house. Um, so to that end, our architect completed a full inventory of each of our elementary school buildings to determine which schools would need to be decommissioned in order for the state to approve the purchase of the Good Shepherd building. So when they do this, they look at 12 very technical factors that if you would like to um, really dive into the weeds and look more deeply at that, you can go to our website. For the sake of time, I'm not going to outline all of those uh, here tonight. However, I will just kind of give a quick overview that some of those things include things like square footage of classrooms, uh, potential for future renovation, um, and ADA compliance or the ability to reach ADA compliance uh, in a uh, more fiscally conservative manner. Uh, and based on all of those things, the recommendation that came from our experts was that Sharp and Garfield are the two schools that should be decommissioned. That recommendation was based on the age of those two buildings, um, being the two oldest in our district, and uh, therefore making them the most costly to renovate to add on to as a building and to make ADA compliant. So the reasons um, for the, the decommissioning of the two schools that we're decommissioning have everything to do with the recommendations of the architect about what buildings um, are the most difficult for us to improve upon in the coming years. The other three elementary schools, Newby, Tatum, and Zane North, while far from in perfect shape, no one is claiming that, are the three schools that are either currently ADA compliant, which would be Zane North, or constructed in a way that makes it much more cost efficient to bring them up to compliance, which is new to them. They are also constructed in ways that make things like additions or renovations uh, easier to do and more cost efficient as well, 
which is also why um, there's an addition that is being added to Zane North um, as part of this proposal to accommodate more students because it's quite easy to uh, add on to it based on the way it was constructed in the first place. So it has nothing to do with uh, a preference of location or buildings or anything like, like that or students in the buildings. It has to do with the physical buildings themselves. But that one with the shape that it was designed in is very easy to mirror on the other side of it. Um, and since cost is a, a big part of our responsibility here, um, we, that is why those are the, the schools that are in the proposal to decommission and why the schools that are being added on to are the ones that are being added on to. Um, now I wanted to touch just briefly on the field space because that is an, the other portion of this referendum and it's also identifying um, or trying to solve for facilities needs. Um, the field space behind the high school has been insufficient for many years. Um, there's, we have limited use of fields uh, because of the fact that it's, it's grass surface only and we get a lot of rain and the drainage isn't all that great and um, so we can't use it as much as we would like to. There are currently only porta potties, there are no actual bathrooms. There's insufficient seating if, um, if you are in the lower uh, section, it's hard to see anything other than literally what is in front of you. Um, so if you're going there to watch uh, a, a game or even more importantly if you are there for an event such as graduation, you are most likely um, not getting the best uh, view of the full space. Um, the track is not up to regulation. It is currently a five lane track. A six to eight lane track would, would get us to a place where we could actually host um, more, uh, more meets and competitions. So this bond proposal allows us to address those needs and better serve all of our middle school and high school students who use it for PE on a regular basis, but at the moment are not able to use it quite as much as we'd like them to because of, of a lot of the issues that I just mentioned, as well as extracurricular activities and town-wide recreation activities. So finally, one of the, the last questions, frequently asked questions that I'm going to um, cover tonight is uh, that a lot of community members have asked what will happen if this bond proposal does not pass. And the hard truth is, that the answer is that things will stay the way that they are right now, and we will, because we don't have any other option. Um, we've been advised by our architects and engineers that our buildings are only getting older, and that it is only a matter of time before um, something, a major repair is needed that is not something we can cover in our operating budget, or that we have a in capital reserve in order to fund it. Um, so we are looking at this as a planning for the future uh, where that is some, we are able to head off some of those issues at the pass um, as opposed to kicking the problem to another board or another iteration of our community years later when um, things are, are in even worse shape. Right now the schools are, buildings and grounds team is phenomenal. They're doing the best they can with these, with these old buildings. This proposal would give us more options and more flexibility. Um, major repairs would be a huge disruption to our students and our staff, and we're trying to prevent that. In addition to that, in the long run, the, a bond referendum that fixes some of these issues um, of space now saves us money because there is no state funding for emergency repairs, whereas we do get some state funding for bond referendums. Um, additionally, it would mean that our middle and high school students will continue to not be able to be outside for PE as often as we'd like. Uh, we will continue to not be able to host band competitions, regional meets, tournaments, things like that, because our fields, our track, and our facilities are just not up to standard. Um, and it would mean that our, our opportunities for community-wide events, for opening up our facilities to the town recreation programs would be as limited as they are now, if not more so as time goes on, because we are having to let the grass rest um, and make sure that it's, it's playable enough um, for those activities, uh, sports activities that we have on it um, for our high, middle school and high school. So to, to kind of bring it back to um, the, our purpose, our purpose is to address facility needs before they get to an emergent nature, and we think that this proposal uh, gets us closer to where we need to be. It's not the end. As I said before, it's the beginning, um, and we will be in the coming months talking much more about um, uh, providing resources for folks about how um, how we co we believe that we can uh, achieve all of the other things we'd also like to achieve, and uh, we're going to have some folks talk about some things that are not in this plan because they can't be, not because we wouldn't love them to be, 
Um, but all of the resources uh, that we will be speaking about will be on our website. And in, in the coming months, we'll be holding more info sessions, um, info for seniors about how they can um, potentially apply for tax breaks, getting more information out to, to all of you um, to better understand what this plan entailed and also um, what we could be gaining from it. So with, um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Craig to talk a little bit about some of the frequently, the other frequently asked questions. Thank you. And thank you again, everyone, for coming out uh, for both of these sessions. It's great to see so many folks out. And, uh, we understand there are a lot of factors that are involved in making decisions on this plan, and our goal is to share as much information as we can. Uh, the frequently asked questions um, document on the website will be updated after these two sessions, so you can kind of see some more answers and some more clarity. But I did want to just request for that, so we will be putting those up in the coming days and weeks. Um, here are a couple questions that we had received in the last week that are popped up. The first one being, um, what are plans to transport families with sharp edges to one of the other homes in the Hamilton area? So we, we've stated clearly our belief in the power and the possibility that are integrated in the strategic planning area. The logistical challenge created by closing Charles and Parkfield remains an obstacle. Um, and we believe that better connectivity and improved walking and bikeability is a benefit for all students in the community. To our end, we have engaged the Safety of the School County Planner uh, to analyze the current paths to school and possible future routes. Uh, the safe, through safe routes, they are able to coordinate with state, county, and local officials better to plan, strategize, and address potential obstacles and cross streets that could potentially be posed by these hazards. Uh, they also have access to funding from the state and county for professional impact studies and other information that would help us in crafting these routes. Um, we are also reviewing our current biking school policy and our scheduling educational experiences led by safety of some schools for our, our daily students. Uh, and ultimately, we look forward to working with the broader community to improve walking bikeability throughout Collins. Another question was, if in, was that the FAQs are vague on the plans for Sharp School as a community center. What are the details of the plans as a community center? What types of programs, what facilities will be made available to the community to help those types of students? Um, we believe that converting SHARP to a community gathering space presents an opportunity to continue the use of SHARP building and bring value add to our town. Um, the space will remain a property of the school district um, with the option for us to move offices or other support services to the location to free up space in our other buildings. We um, also just want to be very clear that we are going to earmark some of the funds from the sale of our field to help with the shift in use. Um, we, there's no part within our plan where we intend to keep this in The other major obstacle that we've had up to this time is this is a very difficult conversation to have with the boss of the school. We recognize that. Um, to create a community space, you have to engage the community. If you wanted to give the time and space for the community to experience this, it would be a cost. Um, and we've started to talk about what the community would look like. I think we are getting closer to that point. And I think that there are, we have a few opportunities, um, and there will be more in the future, um, post the vote to discuss what the community would look like. There are a lot of current services that make a lot of sense, and I think there's a lot of great community ideas that we can utilize to help make the decisions that are best for, for all of Collins and Hamilton County. Um, this last one is kind of encompassing a lot of very specific questions that we had on the updates to the athletic field. Um, a lot of them basically asking why and what the benefit to students is going to be. Um, we see this, this is one of the biggest spaces in town that is dedicated recreation. Um, this, this design will eliminate a lot of the dead space that's been surrounding the design there and not being used, and then adding more athletic and recreation space there. The main field reorientation will free up a lot of that space. By turfing it, aligning it for multiple sports, it means that more activities are able to take place on there. Um, we noted we had to pull back a lot of our um, approval for outside organizations or even non big college sports teams into those fields so that come graduation uh, the field is able to accommodate more parents, families, students um, and that sort of thing here. Um, the, there will be raised bleachers to help with visibility. Um, we will be utilizing the space underneath those bleachers by adding bathrooms and locker rooms so you don't have to go back into the school to be able to access 
those spaces. Um, there will be a concession stand, a ticket booth, a uh, press box where students with student cameras, journalists, student journalists, um, those who do tours and other activities, that can have a meeting space that you all can see all the activities that we have. Um, this will be a space that has a mix of turf and grass. Um, it'll be a space that we hope to be planning and open up not just to our Collinswood athletes to be able to take benefit of, but to the broader community as well. Um, we want this to be something that is both accessible but then also flexible for future use. So I don't think it's an area of investment that we need a lot, but it's something that has been looked at for quite some time. And we'd like to see this plan be used for future use. So those conclude the three questions that I put together. Just to go over just a few items before we open it up to our community, uh, we just want to make sure um, that we're providing as much clarity as possible. And so we fully acknowledge that several parts of this proposal include placeholders uh, that require a future community input and planning. For example, uh, playgrounds, athletic field designs, um, community center, all of those core pieces uh, require an affirmative uh, vote and commitment before the planning and the discussion can begin to take place with our goal being um, a full uh, proposal launch or implementation for September of 2027 as it relates to student movement. Uh, and so we have time in order to uh, make sure that our community um, is at the forefront of these decisions. There are also things that are not part of the referendum but are currently on our radar. And so uh, Mr. Perez referenced earlier uh, you know, transportation discussion, you know, safe routes to schools, um, issues. Um, or challenges in some of our other aging buildings. We do have a long range facility plan which includes projects, small and large, for every building that we wish to get to. And so uh, the best way to kind of describe this is that um, you know, those of us who have recently conducted or performed a renovation in our home, uh, if you've done a kitchen reno, uh, you know that there's always a start, there's a budget, and then there's the actual cost. It does not mean that the rest of your home is perfect. It just means that at that particular moment in time, that's the project that you're working on while you're trying to pursue that HGTV plan. And so uh, we fully acknowledge that um, with aging infrastructure, there are going to be um, challenges associated with it. So we're not ignoring some of our existing buildings. Some of our buildings are going to be uh, taken care of using local capital funds. Some will be uh, addressed using uh, uh, proceeds from the sale of district inventory, uh, but the largest majority of what we're asking for uh, in this proposal is really to support um, the needs of the, the Shepherd as well as the expansion to the main and to the additional classrooms and gaining access to those things. Um, in addition, there are also things that legally we cannot include in the referendum. For example, uh, teacher training, uh, student programs, additional staff. Uh, referendums are construction project funded funds. Um, and so it can only be used for capital expenditures or infrastructure. Uh, sometimes the things that you know, happen behind the scenes by heating, uh, uh, HVAC units, plumbing, drainage, all of those things that are extremely important but are not really needed. And so um, there's a couple of things that we want to also make sure as we wrap up. And so with the sale of, of district property, that gives us an opportunity to address uh, some of the other uh, projects that are not included in this referendum, because our goal is for our buildings to function at the highest level possible for the longest period of time, keeping in mind that some of our other buildings are between 70 and 100 years old. The average life cycle or expected lifespan of a school building is 35 years. And so we know that we're living on borrowed time in every one of our facilities. But I'll say again, um, thanks to the robust nature of our buildings and grounds crew, they do a phenomenal job of making sure that we keep our buildings operating at a high level uh, so that students can get the degree that they're seeking. Um, and then the second and the final piece just to, to note is that when we think about capacity and we think about planning for the future, we also want to make sure that the community understands is that we have 
the previous bond referendum debt rolling off in 2030, this will free up tens of millions of additional funds uh, for the community to consider future programs when we pass the bond referendum. So we just wanted to make sure that we're providing that information. Okay. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite folks who would like to ask questions to the mic. Polite reminders are going to ask you to keep it to a question. We're going to ask folks to keep it to, to one question when they're up, and we'll try and get through as many people as possible before um, we invite additional questions from folks who have already asked. My name is Maria Tomat. I'm a longtime resident of Sugarman Way here, half Glen Valley Village, and some of us in the Sugarman Way community. But I'm still very interested in what goes on in the city. Last time in the information session, um, was the, much of the discussion was about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one of the things that's being addressed by the change in the model. Now, do I understand this correctly, that at the new in the new model, instead of kindergarten through fifth grade at every day, there will be different grades at each building. So that one building has kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Is that part of what's going on? Yes. Okay. Uh, so there would be kindergarten through third grade at right. three of the elementary schools. The Shepherd building would become an upper elementary school serving fifth grade. Okay. We we haven't had sixth grade as part of the elementary schools for a while now. The middle school starts in sixth grade. I told you. My <laughs> I know. That's, I, I was just updating you. <laughs> like, I haven't been to a PTA meeting in a really long time. So, so there you go. So, but my question is, what's the evidence that decentralizing or deconstructing a community building like the school actually does anything to increase I didn't hear any evidence last time that that's supported by the village. I, I would like to know why you think that's going to change equity, diversity, and inclusion in our school system when our schools reflect the diversity of the neighborhoods they're in. I don't see how you can. I'm going to make sure they get to answer that Thank question. You. Well, I just want to, just for the last half. I don't see how, if the community isn't already diverse, how you can force diversity into the classroom by moving kids out of the middle school. Thank you. So, so thank you for your question. And so to quickly answer that, that question, um, this is a construction project. There's two primary goals. And so the primary goal for this proposal is to increase educational space for students. The secondary goal is to make sure that all of our schools reflect the diversity within our community. And so that's an important goal, but that wasn't the goal that we started with. The initial goal that we started with is how do we address being over capacity for the greater part of a decade in our elementary schools with this new property that gives us significant flexibility in how we do that. Pass it to Roger. Go yeah, ahead, so, Roger. So part of, part of, again, back to the original piece is that this is a facilities question, right? But then within this um, proposal to bring the shepherd is this opportunity for us to work on racial and ethnic integration. We have currently uh, elementary schools with very different uh, proportions of, of different races and percent white in one elementary school, 60% non white in the other. One of the things that, that I, pers I personally feel is that when you talk about neighborhoods, Concord is less than two square miles. And, and I, I remember a, a community member last time coming up, you know, what would you do if Concord had multiple fire houses? How would you do that? The thing is, quite frankly, we have one fire house in Concord, which is a small community. Right? And so when we talk about neighborhoods, kids staying within those neighborhoods, I personally believe the ideal should be that time would be there. I also want to caution us when we talk about kids staying within the neighborhoods because that is historically a way in which segregation has happened. This term of kids should stay within their neighborhood. Um, and so 
this gives us opportunity. Yes, it's about the facility. It's about bringing in uh, big shots. It gives us all of our data in the spaces they deserve. And within that opportunity to bring in some facilities, we have this opportunity to also work on integration and innovation in the back end. So it's a really big opportunity for us. meeting where we're not getting... Can you give us your name? We just want to oh, make sure Stuart, we have it. Stuart okay. Campbell. Okay. I'm our director. Is there going to be a meeting where the public can have more than one second and actually, yes, especially with this DEI situation, it's there's a lot to that that goes back decades and decades and decades, and they're brushing over it and being rushed when people are trying to ask the question. Uh, I was only inspired by the last question to ask that, but like at this meeting, are we going to have like this person can get up for five minutes and say, this is what happens in my neighborhood, and this is what has happened historically. Or are we just going to have catchphrases and brush over the issue? Like so, Stuart, this, this meeting particularly, the purpose is to ask direct questions. Right, right. But Anyone is welcome at public comment to come and speak and share their personal experience. I believe it's three minutes um, legally okay. that they're required to do that. But okay. tonight we do really want to make sure we get to everyone's okay. question. I understand that. The last meeting and the meeting before, anytime somebody asked a question, they were rushed, and then when they asked a clarifying question, it was brushed over, and I feel like the public isn't getting a chance to express or get the answers that they want. I feel like it's being rushed, and uh, that's not even my question. I'm just saying, like, there has to be a point where questions can actually organically come out, and we can get the actual answers there question last time was about the special education program, and you guys made her clarify three times and then still didn't answer, and it was plain as, in, plain as day what she was asking. So, Stuart, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say in the spirit of our community agreements, we're really trying to create space. I know it is difficult, and I, I empathize with you that, like, there is a lot of things that people have in their minds they'd like to say. We are not, I'm not trying to rush people, but I all, and I understand that like personal experience and anecdotes really want to accompany the question. I'm doing my best to make sure we can get to the question and get to the heart of the matter for all of the people that need want the answers to the question. I know folks are, are willing to um, hear public comment, but I am going to push us tonight to make right, sure we yeah, hear I'm, questions. I'm, not talking, I'm asking I'm specifically the next meeting. Like, yeah. Is so there going to be like... I might be able to, just again, because I... The, the reason that we're doing these now in March, like March, April, and it's a September vote is we want to be able to continue this conversation leading up to the vote and, and, and after. I mean, the conversations about what's happening in our schools is, is that should be every day. There, there are the constraints of the space. We fully recognize that, and we, but we want to try to accomplish and get through as many questions as we can, realizing that we're not going to be able to answer everybody's. Right. And, and there is a lot of nuance and a lot of detail that goes into fully understanding these, and we're going to try to do our best to share that in a way that is accessible. Um, and I, I know you said you had a, your, another question to that. I don't know what yeah, that I, meant. I just wanted to like kind of understand the guidelines, because the last meeting, there was a lot of times where people felt rushed, did not get their answers, you know, and then all of a sudden at the end of the night, it's like, I understand you guys want to get out of here, but like, This is a big issue, and if you're not answering the question and somebody asks a qualifying question to brush them away, it's kind of messed up. Like, at what point, like, it's not really communication, you know? It's Stuart, I'm going to have to ask you to, to right. we've heard your point, and yeah. I understand. We're okay. going to, I want to make sure you get your question, and then I want to make sure we get to everyone else's question. Okay. So, the figures on this website, especially for phase one, it looks like, there's going to be 450 plus tax increase to fund phase one. Then there's reassessments coming for people's property. If you look at across the board, studies show when you close a school, property values go down by almost $4,000 in some cases. The next phase for Sharp uh, and any, like last time you guys said you're going to sell Garfield for $12 million and that'll help fix newbie or whatever, everything's getting pushed down. But what is the funding for the next phases, and is there going to be an increase, and why isn't all of this detail like actually explained in detail on the website? It's vague, and it's hard for people to understand. 
And we'll let Dr. Mandel answer that. Thank you. So, Mr. Campbell, let me explain. Uh, so, I, I want to be very clear. Um, you're asking valid questions, completely valid. We are not in a position to answer hypothetical questions. So, in terms of specific tax impact based on individuals' specific home property, we won't have the, that calculation until we actually get uh, information back from the state on whether or not we can even come back to the community with the question. And so the rates won't be locked in until then, and so you won't have a calculation. In terms of home values for a, a, a future, I would say that you know, there are different sources um, that can combat that. And in terms of getting detailed and specific, we are in, as we shared you know, two weeks ago, we are in the schematic phase. And so the actual design phase comes when funds are made available through the approval process of, a, of the ballot question to actually fund uh, architectural drawings. And so uh, drafts or schematics are based on industry estimates at the time of the design. And so we're not going to be able to give you specific or concrete numbers until the referendum moves forward and we actually are able to have all of that information made ready and available per pending approval from the state. And currently, uh, we don't have state approval for that. And so that's the reason why we're at this schematic, uh, estimated phase. I can ask one follow-up. Um, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you, you had a large share of the mic, right. and I want to make sure we get to everyone in line. Thanks. Hi, I'm Becky Sieg. I am a sharp parent of a preschooler and first grader. Um, my question, I appreciate much of the questions that came before around kind of how we are not in a vacuum and there are broader things happening in terms of finances in the community. My question relates to that. For SHARP, I'm curious what impact this will have on the Title I funding and related programming and services that students have SHARP have access to based on their school classification. Uh, so the Title I funding travels to the student, and so it where whatever school the, the, the student attends, the funding follows. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'm Kira Brecker. Um, it's sort of a follow-up comment to Ms. Tremont's um, question a few questions ago. Um, will the new assignment for students homeschooled be randomized to truly achieve optimal diversity, or will there still be catchment areas where students are assigned to learning areas? So that's also a great question. And so um, this topic was brought up by a community advocacy group last week. And so I'll share with you exactly what I shared with them. It's that once there is an affirmative response from the community on whether or not we're going to move forward, then the clock starts for us to work through the community to identify what that formula really needs to look like, what goal are we trying to achieve. Um, and so that goes back into one of those hypotheticals. And so the goal is to make sure that in every school they mirror the diversity within our community. That includes uh, racial, socioeconomic, and linguistic um, in an inclusive way. Um, we currently have 357 uh, students with IEPs. We also have roughly 60 students that are receiving multilingual learner services, in addition to students that are receiving targeted levels of academic intervention and as well as the range of uh, socioeconomic challenges, diversity, gender, identity, expression, all of those core pieces. And we want to make sure that every one of our schools mirrors what we're seeing that's happening. And so that process um, would start um, post-September of this year. Um, it would probably take us about a year in order to engage the community to make sure that we have not only the right variables, but we're striking the right balance projecting out what we're going to need and how we're going to assign from September of 2017. Thank you. Hi, Teresa Marcaziano. Um, <clears throat> I just had a question about the grade level schools. Uh, why is it somewhat of a hybrid of grade levels, uh, K through three, and instead of like a K and a one, a two and a three, and then the upper level school, and a pre-K, is there a reason for that? Um, and so when we look at what is developmentally appropriate, um, and so specifically when we looked at the Good Shepherd, which is the anchor of our discussion for this evening, the Good Shepherd 
uh, was really a better position for, for the coach. Uh, we also are trying to acknowledge the fact that much of the anxiety that we have experienced within our community generally comes second semester of fifth grade as students begin to approach middle school. And so that has been um, an area of intensity for many of our families. And so when we think about the Good Shepherd as a much larger building, um, we're, we're provided an opportunity for older students, grades four and five, to see a middle school-like experience so that all of our students, give, uh, they get two years sooner of coming together and we have the opportunity to be more flexible and more innovative in terms of instructional models so that the transition to middle school is not so scary and it better positions our students for academic success. In terms of kindergarten through third grade, we wanted to limit the level of transition because grade three is that first uh, high stakes testing year, and we wanted a level of continuity and an additional transition would not benefit our children. Thank you. I just wanted to add on the, the other issue, that was my feedback, um, it's just the space in the buildings, and getting to the point where we have alphabetized or alphabetized students coming through at the shift buildings, um, and more alphabetized kindergarten, it created more complications when it was kind of hybrid Does it cost extra money to have the electrical system on campus? The answer, I, I, don't, I don't know the specifics. That's kind of a backhand question. I don't either. That's but I do asking. know the answer is yes, and okay. it is built, built into the, the soft costs that you would see on the, um, the cost proposal. And the reason that it is often recommended this is just information I have from a workshop I went to. Um, the reason that it is, it is often recommended to, to do it as a separate um, ballot question as opposed to during the general election is we want folks to, to be fully informed and fully focused on what they're voting on in this proposal as opposed to the bevy of things that they'll be voting on, particularly this coming year in the November election. Does that make sense? pay for the publishing of the question and the poll workers. Do you have a number of students on that? She budgeted just under 10,000. She does not think it's going to be that high. This is just for everyone watching at home so that they can hear the questions, <laughs> hear the answers. So the cost is less than $10,000. So the grand scheme of this plan, it's part of the soft cost. And the reason Hi, Lindsay Oster. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, one question that has come up a lot is, um, what is the plan for widespread communication of the referendum, um, especially for those who aren't involved in their schools as much as most of us are, those without children in the Collingswood schools, and also those who do not speak English as their first language? That's a great question. So um, in full transparency, large public meetings are are not always the best to have documented uh, conversations, especially uh, when you're talking about things that are intricate and detailed. And so uh, post this meeting and post us going over all of the uh, 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 questions and posting the most updated FAQs, uh, we're going to go back to the drawing table and what we believe will be more appropriate uh, for a period of time is smaller, more intimate settings with smaller groups. Uh, you are correct. We have more um, community members over the age of 65 than we do under the age of 18. And so every community member of the 14,000 plus, are, it's important that we engage them, but we also have to engage them in different ways. And so we will be working on building a schedule and increasing opportunities for smaller Robin Brownfield. Um, I have lived in the Sharp School neighborhood for 35 years. Uh, my kids went there, five kids went there, 
and my grandchildren have been. Um, I am also the person who um, organized the building of a mural outside the school. And I donated my services for uh, that mural. Um, I did not accept any payment because it was to be a donation to Sharp School and to the community. And what I want to know is um, what you envision will happen to our community when Sharp School is removed as a school. Thank you for the question and again for the donation of the time for the mural. So there are going to be extensions of the spaces to make sure that that the status of the community will still be preserved and that that is a huge part of it. Um, that this is a space over there that there is not a lot of recreation in. There are other parts of the recreation facility that are smaller and fewer. And so this is outside of what the town would need to switch to a bigger recreation space. talk about a, the, other, the other options and services that we can house in there as well. Uh, again, it's not something that we can do right now. Uh, but you have no it. concrete plan for it. I'm sorry? Well, you have no concrete plan for it right now. To, to tell the community no what was going. Nothing. To, to tell the community what was going into the space without actually engaging them about what would be in the space to understand what the costs are. And I don't know that that would be enough information either. Mm -hmm. um, we have the, the money that we put into the Teacher Village Development uh, PLC. Mm -hmm. There's conversations about how to um, um, Deal for a third country in the school. There are currently six K through twelve programs with assistance from the state. So that takes all of your time away. And I know that on the first floor, you have said that those offices could not be used. Um, so my question is, based on the current plans, where will the library go? Where will art go? ASL go? Music go? And your kids go? And that's not even including the school. Occupational therapy, counseling, where are all of those additional services? Because to me, a student in Teacher School, where will they be housed? Because otherwise, they're going to be in the Baldwin School, which is primarily I work with the Baldwin Youth Program to begin with. This school is not of its own over eight years. So, where will those kids go, and how will we service the fourth and fifth graders with all of these additional services? So in, in looking at the architectural plans, and I know some of them are cut off in there, but there is a dedicated library space that is at the other end of the um, cafeteria. Yes, um, down there. Um, there is also, um, we built in a lot of those small movie spaces at the end of the first floor. You know where like the, I believe the, um, where the elevator is down at that end of the hallway? Um, I don't have the name of it. I just but have the accounting thing and I have the bookmark. So let me, let, me, let, me, let me answer that. So th thank you for the question. So um, I'm going to share it again. We're currently in what's called the schematic phase. Mm -hmm. 
And so we have mock-ups just so that um, there is an understanding of what you would like to achieve. And so when we, when once we have an affirmative response from the community that says no, then real architectural plans um, and measurements will be taken into account for some of those pieces. And then projections will be made based on the estimated or projected enrollment for the September 2027 launch. And so what I will say is, is that there are spaces not in that initial mock-up um, that would be included. And so there's additional space also on the first floor near the library for small group construction. Um, and so um, we're all of those four pieces will be factored in um, once we have the resources needed to get to that point. Yes, Ms. Mercado. So I, I do want to I do want to refocus that the the goal of, of this uh, referendum is to help us build flexibility in the process, adding to the number of schools. Um, I, I also want to comment in terms of the community as a member of the school that there are many classrooms there, and I think that's part of the reason why we're not attaching or asking for the schematic changes that we are to ask for how we get to that point. But again, there's a lot of flexibility. size of the enrollment that we have right now. Um, I want to make sure we're asking for those things. Um, and just uh, one other point that I, I wanted to make just in general is that in order for us to be able to get this plan approved by the state, we would have to make, the state would have to see that we were able to adequately serve students in all of those buildings the way we're saying that we would. So concerns that that may not be the case, I hope could be um, cleared a little bit that it, if we truly couldn't fit the students that we needed to fit with the services that are required for them in those buildings, the state would say, well, you, why would you redesign that school then? Um, that's, it's not going to work. It can't work that way. Um, so there's a lot of, as we've been saying, there's a lot of nuance to how all of that works. We don't know uh, who we're putting into those buildings in September of 2027. Um, we don't, the, the classroom sizes are, the classroom spaces, excuse me, are much larger at Good Shepherd School um, than they are in some of our elementary school buildings. That is not to say that we are uh, planning to make our class sizes large. In fact, I think this would help to do, to do the opposite of that, particularly at the kindergarten and first grade level where classes are already quite large, but they're not at the fourth and fifth grade level. Um, and so just to clarify that they may feel large for the classroom spot, the space that it's in, but the number isn't. Not in the grand scheme of things. Um, go ahead. I know you don't believe me, but go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. If Good Shepherd's classrooms are larger, would you potentially, with the flexibility, move A1 there? Never. They don't have the same math. Ms. So Negri, you'd also didn't get the chance to introduce yourself. Hi, I just want you to get Nicole Negri. I teach at Garfield, and I have for 21 years. Um, so based on the referendum pl uh, plan for zoning, it, it specifically says six new classrooms in A to kindergarten, and I know that it's flexible, got it. Um, but will that house, I mean, based on that proposed plan, will that only house kindergarten? So I think I want to go back to the, the thing that we're talking about. Part of like the plan our students are kindergarten, right? But the but our enrollment in September 2027 uh -huh. is not certain. So when we're talking about what we need, that's basically one of the key pieces of this plan is flexibility. Depending on what the enrollment needs of them are that can be met in September 2027, those classrooms will be used for kindergarten. And they'll some yeah. will just have the luxury of a bathroom versus yeah. others. Um, yeah, all, the, all, all of the half. Right, but what about the other wing? Who would be 
in the other wing with no vegetables. Kindergarten has to have that, correct? Okay, so, so let me let, let yeah. me interject. So when looking at if we're going to add additional space, yeah. so keeping in mind this is a construction project, we wanted to add uh, classroom space with flexible classrooms that could accommodate any number. And so each of the new classrooms at Zane can accommodate kindergarten through grade five, if necessary, based on their design and the fact that they have bathrooms. And so we weren't going to spend several million dollars and not have the maximum amount of flexibility. So the bathroom but is there for the rest of the The students. bathroom is there just So the yes. label as a kindergarten is just a box. Correct. It's just a box. It's just a box of labels. Okay, so then ideally that, that would be a K through five. Wanted clarification. The referendum question, the referendum is the referendum, right? And that's it. It can't be changed. It can't be altered. But what we have put out is the question that we will get in September, right? Well, the plan that we've given right now is the is the plan. The specific right. question hasn't been written yet. So but I mean, yes. but the, the plan that's yes. been out, it, it's not going to change drastically. Not going to change drastically. Had, that's correct. Listed it. Yes. As this is what the referendum is. Yes. That's correct. Uh, can it be split into two, or would it be split into two? It can be split into two questions. We are not splitting it into two questions. Okay. And just to clarify, um, the potential is Sharpwood Close to become a um, community center run by the district. To be determined. Um, it would be owned by the district. Okay. Uh, and. Um, but we would continue, and we would close and sell Garfield, but we would continue to rent space for pre-K from the Methodist Church? Out of the funds from the pre-K funding grant, which is a separate funding source, yes. But we wouldn't own that building, and we would continue to rent it. Correct, but the, those funds don't come out of our general operating fund. And I just think that's an important distinction, that's all. Okay, that's why I'm repeating. Right. Yep, that's and right. We, and we will also continue to use Oak Lynn all of the pre-K spaces will continue to be used. Calls at Oak Lynn, call, potential new calls at Parkview, and the, the Methodist Church. Correct. Calls at Parkview. Again, this is a separate funding source altogether. We get no, we get separate funding from the So we do the have state. classes at Parkview. I was we do not yet. That, is, that is for next for next year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, Tara Woods. Educator, but not here. Um, I have a few questions, but I just realized I didn't finish one of them. Um, and I, so I'm really excited about the potential of new space. I have a two-year-old, so I'm not in the system yet. Um, but in the process of doing my research, I learned that there's not one Collingswood Elementary School that has a librarian. There are some Collingswood Elementary Schools that do not even have a library space. I won't consider shelves or book nooks library space. Um, we're creating new space. Very excited about that. Talking about a library at the end of a cafeteria, which I would need to see what that looks like. We have flexibility. Is there money to allocate to building libraries back into our schools? Because when I look at our data, which some of it's not great, and there's a lot of data about the importance of literacy, school libraries, and librarians who curate them for student success? It's a great question. And so I, I think that I, I'm, I'm going to try to, to, to be as direct and, and circle back. And so what this referendum provides us is flexibility and opportunities to address some of the space issues that contributed to us having to get rid of libraries in the first place. And so what we would be focused on building is maximizing the utilization of each and every building, including the new spaces. Um, but we, we don't, we, we, we're not going to be able to successfully answer that until we know what we're actually planning to do. And so the goal is to make sure that we're utilizing every space. And so what this referendum affords us is additional things uh, that we can add back into our existing schools that we currently do not have capacity to do, such as libraries, uh, small group instruction spaces, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
So as a parent, just a quick follow-up, who cares more about literacy than sports fields, and I grew up playing sports, this is, for me, a good faith vote. You can't tell me that, Ferdinand, right? It's a good faith vote. This is a good, this is a good faith vote, because at the end of the day, we have to engage our community to make sure we're meeting their needs, but we need the flexibility and the opportunity to make the savings. The, uh, one, of the, one of the big pieces is, is again, the space, and, and that's uh, you know, Coach Eckler, again, has a dedicated library space. And just to remind folks, uh, this bond referendum discloses that the funds can only be used for those precincts or for capital buildings. And so the, the, the other ones. Oh, was it wasn't in the cafeteria. I just want to make that oh, point clear. No, it, it, in the schematic, you pass the cafeteria. Hi, Susanna Bauman. I have two children at Sharp, and I'm very excited about a preschooler coming in next year. Um, my question is about parking. There was nothing written in the initial referendum about it, and then we just kind of saw it in the FAQs about preschool. Um, I'm curious about how many classrooms will hold, how do we plan to secure it, um, is the playground going to be shared with the residents that are there? I just wanted to start. Um, I apologize if I made it sound as if calls at parking is no, part of the referendum no. because it's not. Okay. That's, a, that's a separate issue altogether, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cal to actually answer the question. So thank you for your question. So to, to, to start, our goal um, has and will continue to be is to make sure that high-quality free preschool is available to every Collinswood resident. Um, and so we are in active negotiation with a long-term lease agreement with Parkview to expand additional pre-K seats brand new classrooms, playgrounds, and then flexible lease space. Uh, we're still in active negotiation, but the goal is for those to be um, known very soon um, and for a September start date. And so right now, we would probably be looking to add uh, at least three additional classrooms. So Sharp has six preschool classrooms, so I'm just wondering where the other three would go then that Sharp can own. So you're talking about a hypothetical of 20 and so our goal, um, continuing, is to make sure that we are meeting the needs. And so we're going to continue to look for preschool available space because until we reach what's called our universe, so our universe is the state projection of the number of children in your community, age three and four, that qualify for preschool. And so our goal, separate and apart, using the preschool grant expansion dollars is to continue adding space exclusively for preschool. So that would be separate and apart okay. from our traditional I'd also like, like to add. That's another question I have. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I'd, I'd also like to add that um, I think there's a, a question uh, previously, I think uh, one of the teachers asked about bathrooms, right, and people within uh, classrooms. And it's really important to recognize that currently in our current usage of facilities, we have to get um, waivers from the state because we, we don't have adequate space or bathrooms in some of our classrooms and some of our pre-play classrooms, past classrooms, right? And so that's one of the things where we talk about space, talk about flexibility, talk about improving our space. That's what this referendum is about, is understanding that, yes, while we may be uh, currently meeting the needs of, of, of kids, um, it's through, at times, waivers that we can um, improve on uh, through this referendum. Did you say a, a new playground was going to be built? That's not that not the one that's there. I'm just curious how you're going to like secure the playground that's shared with four buildings. So they're currently working. They're working through the details, which is why we're still in negotiation um, in terms of lease terms, access uh, to playground space, parking, and so forth. Thank you. Hi, my name is Robin Bonfield. I have a third grader from Tenari C at Sharp, and I have a sixth grader from Middle C. And in listening to this in the previous um, sessions, I heard a lot of really great questions that the answers to would be charts, examples. Here's who we would work with to figure this out, not just ambiguous. Because right now, it's not really clear to me and to, I think, some others, what can be looked at? What can be changed? What is part of the, part of, what is their direction? Part of this is not approved by the funder, right? Like, what if a problem comes up? What happens? And it's like, 
he's engaged in making those changes. So I think being really clear, what, what can we adapt or change or have a voice in if they're not figured out yet, and what will that look like? Right now, I think there's a, a trust that there's so many people that believe the same thing. These are the things. It's the cat. It's the same argument, and then how do you accept it? Which side of this are they falling on? Because all of these people who care about diversity, equity, inclusion, who care about our kids, we're on separate sides of this. So, like, pick one. Give us the information that we need to get one way or the other. Or else we're going to all get I want to make sure we get to your question, and I, I think it was pretty clear. It was what is what mm -hmm. is able to be kind of inputted on what will that process look like? I want you to and that can the, you restate that. I want to get to yes, that. Yes, and that the facts in their answers are not just a paragraph or a sentence, but we will be working with these people. We don't know this district very yet, but they sure as heck did one a few years ago for Florida schools, so we know the place. You can give us some examples. You can give us some. There's referendums all over the state right now for these same things. So how did other candidates do it? You can give us some information to look at, to base our opinions on, and not just go with a good faith yes. So that's really helpful feedback. So I just want to clarify to make sure that I fully understand. Okay. So I just want to make sure that I understood it because I think this, this could be very useful. So what you're, if I'm understanding correctly, one of the things that you're asking for is that on the website, in addition to the answers to frequently asked questions, there's also perhaps either links to um, a safe route to school plan or charts or graphs that might show what the breakdown might look like, some more visuals. Would, would that be accurate? Visuals, examples, and collaboration. So we've heard for this for kids, this is what they've had, and this, and we want to know. So kind of who does what? Is that what you mean? Who does what, and how are we planning to work with them? Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. And Rach, I give you the snake. Sorry. Uh, process, there will be many more opportunities for you to get more information and to talk about what you need. So we'll try and give you reference for that. Go ahead. Okay, so we vote yes. Yep, we can have any of these guys. We vote yes. Can you just share your name? They just oh, want to make sure I'm Karina. I have a child at SHARP and a child at CDC. Um, I was just wondering, we vote yes for the referendum. We obtain good shepherd. It all goes um, during the next phase, where do you see putting out this sort of question? Is that, because I don't see on the plan where that's going to play as a key component. So the, um, the space that is currently a, um, a parking lot would be, Good Shepherd School actually uses this in the same way. There's the, there's a gate there, and so that would be blacktop space for the fourth and fifth graders. That is, I don't know, I'm not quite sure what you mean by the phase one and phase two, but um, once well, that I know school. It wasn't in the chart, but what I mean by saying we want to see this as a look at other things, this is probably something we do next. Right. So it, it would be um, blacktop space that, you know, lines could be painted to play different um, games, things like that, the way the fourth and fifth graders use the blacktop space at the schools that they're currently in. Okay, the SHARP yeah. just went through a big grant to the high school and a lot of schools right now are looking at this. Is that going to play into the decision? Um, I, I don't know what grade your child is in, but... Um, this is for Hope's Elementary School. So then um, he would not be a charter candidate, so it would be a sort of this... And also, that could be the snake again. Um, the Good Shepherd space has a really nice gym, which would afford some more opportunities, especially during the winter for the kids, so that they would have more comfort. Thank you for your time. Um, I am curious of the inclusion plan. Again, um, that is a big buzzword that's being thrown out. And um, students want to be in general education, so when we talk about inclusion, does this mean more opportunities for our children to be in general education? I'm concerned because we're adding more space, but no funding from the teachers, and how does that work? Thank you. So, 
currently the um, school district is partnering with the New Jersey Coalition for Inclusive Education. Um, we're currently piloting um, at several of our schools. The goal would be uh, to work collaboratively um, with our educators at the forefront of the development of a long-term plan with the our implementation partner being the, the NJCIE over a period of time in order to build capacity for inclusion. So I mean, we can say that we, we value inclusive schools, but it takes uh, multiple years for it actually to fully manifest. And so we've already begun that work. Uh, we're doing the feasibility studies now. Um, we're currently piloting opportunities in several of our schools with our implementation partner. I'd also jump in, I think, on Maggie, one of the, I think one of your questions there was, you know, whether or not there's funding for staff to work with you, right? I mean, again, this this is about the creating the space to work. Yeah, I understand, the, but we're the funding the, the funding piece is, is something where I think uh, Congressman McDowell has referred to the community, and I think many school district, uh, school districts around the area have required certain people to advocate to state legislators for um, updates to the school funding agenda so that there is uh, available funds to work with. So, for example, currently in the state school funding formula, uh, school districts are given a, a pot of money uh, for special education funding based on just a, a flat percentage across all school districts. So every single school district, no matter how many special education teachers you have, get the same percentage of funding. So there's currently a bill stuck in committee in the New Jersey Senate saying, hey, let's actually give school districts state funding based upon the actual number of special education students that district has, not based on a generalized percentage. That piece right there, I know it's not related to the I, I would encourage our community to go out and uh, advocate to our legislators to have that piece of legislation passed so that we can have that school funding to make space uh, for uh, uh, inclusive staffing of our, our educators. Um, I guess what schools are we piloting? So we currently have several of our elementaries, and then the latest pilot starts at, it has already started at our middle school okay. as well. And then how will um, another teacher brought this up last week, or last, yeah, last week, and it's how you'll navigate three to two and three to five because you're splitting up um, special ed, you know, with, so in the midst of K to two grades, and then three to five grades. So you can't have more of a four-year difference between two and three, but at the same time in school. So what's, there has to be some type of plan already in place to point the school districts to see what can happen. Is there any type of plan how we're going to navigate at least our third graders for um, special ed and, you know, pull out services? So we've already engaged our special services department, um, and those are topics of discussions that the child study team um, will be working on. Um, we have time to work through the details and the logistics. So at the end of the day, we do know that it is a four-year uh, age span, and so it is already an issue. Uh, in our self-contained classes at the elementary level because from year to year, the age of the students that we serve changes. And so we're already navigating that challenge right now. We'll continue to navigate that challenge, but we will plan for multiple contingencies. But our special service team, uh, child study team, as well as our special educators will be leading the development of SIDS. Thank you. Hi, my name is Liz Young. I'm a Tatum parent. Um, so per the NJAC Chapter 26, which is the state of New Jersey code, um, the, all school districts are required to maintain a LRFP, or Long Range Facility Plan, um, which I'm assuming you're all familiar with. That Long Range Facility Plan um, in, has very specific details for how you have a five-year student body projection. Is that correct? Yeah. So we keep being told that we can't, project what anything looks like because we don't know what our student body in 2027 looks like, yet the state gives us very specific requirements for how we can project what that student body will be. Um, can you speak to that? That's going to be more, Beth Ann, can you speak to the, so uh, Liz, what, what's the actual question? So we keep being told that we don't know anything about how our classes are going to break down, what it's all going to look like, because we keep being told to just trust the process. Um, but it seems like we can very accurately project what our student body is going to look like in 2027. So this, I think, Beth Ann, is where did the state get the enrollment projections that are included in things like the long-range facility plan? 
that's like where does that number come from? No, from I state, I or? know where that comes from. I saw oh. in the code what it is. I'm just curious why we keep being told we don't know what the student body will look like when we clearly have to project what it will be. The thing to remember is that these are like demographic projections, right? Out out in five years. So just like the uh, forecast for the weather, it is when you look out further and further, it's a, it's a estimation. We wouldn't go, you know. We wouldn't go and uh, build out classroom rosters based upon that. I understand that, but I, but you're asking your community, like I am projecting what my future budget is going to look like when my taxes go up, and I'm being told that my school district isn't planning ahead for how I'm it's going to I'm going to ask you to, to hold the personal comment, and thank you for asking the question. The, so, the, and so the piece there is, again, the goal of, of the, this referendum is to give us one of, I think one of the important pieces of this referendum is, is that it gives us flexibility within the spaces that, that uh, we're adding um, to adjust as needed. And so kind of the discussion earlier about the, uh, the building, the addition to the dame, right? those, those classrooms were very purposely built in such a way that you can accommodate multiple different ways of looking at on, on what we need at any given time. I think that's one of the main pieces of, of, of this referendum is to give us flexibility that we do not have right now in our facilities. Again, for whatever the, the demographics are, they come in five, six, seven, eight years. I, I think it is, is what can we be doing to set the district up to be more flexible in big years to come, decades to come. And I, and I get that, and I think like getting good shepherd. Can I just is jump in real quick? I, I understand. I can completely understand the frustration of feeling like why can't they give us more specific information? But then I, I guess we're trying to um, to be able to answer your questions as best we can, but also not give you what could be interpreted as inaccurate information because we don't know yet, right? So we can we can project the way. Um, the state does, but if we were to come and say, right now, we are going to be doing X, Y, and Z five years from now, and then we're not able to do that, that's that's not responsible of us either. So I, I completely understand as someone who would like to always know everything that is going on and wants my calendar to be perfect and wants to know where everything is, like, I'm not saying that in a derogatory way at all, but that it's very frustrating to not be able to be like, I want to know how to plan for this. Why can't I know how to plan for this? And to have the answer be, we don't have enough information right. to give that to you. And you're asking us to give up a lot of money that. for um, a lot But of money. I guess what I would hope that folks um, are hearing from all of us up here and from knowing that there are many, many um, things put into place to make sure that we are not um, asking you to put up money for a plan that is going to not serve the students. Um, that, you know, even if you don't necessarily trust all of us or know all of us up here, that there are things in place through the state, through the county, that if, if this plan was not going to be able to serve your kids or to house your kids in an appropriate manner, the state would not allow us to do it. Um, so they are going to look at all of those projections and those numbers to determine whether um, the spaces that we're talking about can can be utilized the way that we're saying that they can. Right, but the state still uh, only. I'm accounts. gonna I'm gonna move us yeah. forward. There's still a number of people in you. line. Um, I'm also gonna ask that um, we're uh, it is approaching eight, but I'm gonna commit to getting to everyone in line who has not asked a question. Hi, Kara Boiler. Uh, I have kids across all the grades. Um, so I. <laughs> I had a really quick question. I, th this um, lends on hypothetical, but I, I think that a lot of people are interested in a potential answer. Um, so right now in the elementary schools, we have um, different sets of services. Uh, each elementary school addresses a separate need. So is there um, an idea about with the three re remaining elementary schools, um, how we're going to address ELL or um, isolated classrooms? Are we hoping to have it at all the schools? The remaining schools, or would there still be individual schools? So, that, uh, Kara, that's a great question. So, the original goal um, of this is to make sure that 
all of the, the uh, services are provided so that, um, for example, a child that uh, lives uh, next door to a school, but that school doesn't have that level of service, and then that child has to go somewhere else, we're trying to avoid that. And so our goal is to make sure that multilingual learners, special uh, needs students, students that are medically fragile, um, can all attend all of the schools. And so that would be the overarching goal um, long term that we're trying to achieve. Great. Thank you. I'm Lisa Lee. I have a, one daughter at Garfield, one daughter at home. Um, just a, a question more on um, Good Shepherd purchase and just some of the logistics there. So I was looking in the plan, and of the, the majority of the cost is renovations, but I think for land and building, it said around 1.5 million. I think you've mentioned, you've kind of alluded to talking with the diocese. How kind of, how are, where, how have those conversations progressed? Is there something in the agreement that you feel confident with that pricing, or is that more kind of architect assessment? Um, just want to understand kind of the confidence and the ability there of, if this passed, how, you know, how secure is that? So uh, I can answer that question. So back in, when we entered into an agreement to rent the space at uh, Good Shepherd, we negotiated a purchase price at that point. So we locked in a purchase price. The purchase price is what you see in the plan. So that is the agreed upon um, that as long as the referendum was passed, that would be what we would be paying at that point for purchasing the land and for maintaining the space. So I had a follow-up question, but I think that might kind of answer it. If referendum didn't pass, has the diocese kind of mentioned what are other options that school or probably just remain vacant, but right now it sounds like they're kind of waiting on a referendum to do anything else. They wrote into, or we negotiated out within the lease agreement, the space to have the flexibility. We didn't know when we leased it when we would be able to go out for the referendum question. So there is flexibility in terms of what's in there, um, but if it does not pass, we won't be back here to talk with them. And it's not going to be on the, if you're renting it, that's going to be on the referendum. or, um, you know, what they're offered. I was having my friends express concern with the church location, what it's going to be offered for the building. Um, and, you know, and if they will be taking classes, then is there any plans in the budget to allow for that reasonable discount? That's a great question. Um, and the, the answer to that is that this is actually um, something that the, the experts should and that is not necessarily all of us up here, but that's the teachers. Um, so the building offers us the ability to have all of Fort Lucas grade and Kalamazoo together. And then the, um, I'm kind of speaking for Dr. Mandel, but I think we said this already, that, um, that the determination about best practice and what would be best for that age group will come from um, the staff and what um, they think would be best for them. So. I know that there's there's kind of a goal of a combination of um, having them come together earlier, uh, meeting those needs, and then also some more middle school readiness things. I'm not quite sure we're going as far as lockers in, in the school. I don't believe that's part of our plan now, and I, I would imagine it's probably not something we're going to put into it later. Um, but, you know, they can all together in fifth grade practice opening um, locks before they go to, to sixth grade uh, the following year, that sort of thing. But the that's a long way of saying we're not the ones that are going to fully make that call. Um, we're just kind of talking about different options that are out there that this would allow for uh, uh, teachers to specialize um, and teach uh, only writing if, or only science if, if that's what is deemed um, the best model for, for whether it be fourth and fifth grade or just fifth grade, that that is something that, the, that we would ask our teachers to, to help us. Rachel 
Hennessy. I'm a newbie parent. Um, I do have a question. And I think we can all agree that we need a referendum, that we need improvement, and that change is scary and everybody's completely overwhelmed and getting lost in all the data and things like that. So I, my question would be, is there any way for us to do any kind of early polling or early surveys and kind of to kind of go off of what someone said earlier about like how are we going to educate the people that aren't invested? I'm invested. I have two children that are young that are going to be going to and want to go to public school, don't want to go to school. So I'm invested. I'm going to be coming to board meetings and all. I'm involved. But people who are not, who are 65, like Dr. McDowell said, like how much of our population is over the age of 65? How do we get them engaged and want to support this referendum? And then I worry that we get to September and there's a vote and there's a tipping point for people and they are going to vote no. And then here we are starting completely over, wasting more time that we're not gonna be helping our children. Well, Ms. Hennessy, I think um, I'm gonna uh, ask you to perhaps consider uh, putting together a community group that <laughs> might be interested <laughs> in educating um, folks on why they, they think that this plan is important. And I only say that um, or I don't, I say that as a joke, but not really. I'm actually serious. You might want to think about it. But something that, the only thing that we as board members can do, or as a board and district can do, is go out and educate about the plan. Um, oftentimes what will happen um, in communities for, for referendums is that there will be groups that will form to go and, and kind of stump for the, the referendum itself, um, why it's needed, why it's important, that sort of thing. We can um, be there to answer questions. We certainly will be sending out informational things, like informational mailers, to reach um, people who are not uh, members of our school community already, that sort of thing. Um, but that's the tricky part, is, is figuring out all the yeah. different ways that we need to Which, engage folks. I mean, as educators, and I'm not an educator, but um, I'm friends with the doctor, and I, I understand that you know, the unknown is scary. So if everybody doesn't know and they're not understanding all the study says they're doing and all the statistics and, you know, maybe providing it like the one woman had suggested, like that's a great idea because then we, when I have time, I'm going to go through that. So I just worry that, like, people aren't going to understand something. So out of the fear of not understanding, they're going to vote no. And then, again, like, my, my kindergartner is going to be affected by that because she would be going to just, so I just, is there like some, some, some kind of plan that we can come up with? I, I can answer that. Okay. I've been in contact with some members from the state and with having the need to run some plans in the Delaware, and we will be starting in uh, the end of May doing every two or three weeks senior uh, information sessions where we'll be able to go over the referendum, what the benefits are, and also have someone from the state go over the tax break that they can get with the property taxes going up. And there is other community groups that are coming together that's figuring out how do we reach, to your point, um, citizens in town who don't have kids or the kids aren't in the school system and seniors. So there is going in and that will be more to come. I think we just, everybody here wanted to be really focused and trying to answer as much as we can starting now. And, and maybe it's a good time to start doing it like this kind of like informal event just like how the gentleman earlier said, like if we can mingle yeah. and ask you questions without like me. Being, right. <laughs> I mean you're totally doing, fair. You're doing great. I don't I don't totally envy fair. you. Yeah, I don't envy you at all. Um, especially when you're dealing with me. But um, yeah, like just some like informal type of thing so we can kind of engage in dialogue. Like I don't want to torture my kids' friends parents are crazy. You know? <laughs> and I th I think we want to thank you and people like you because we get a lot of ideas for how to reach different members of the community through different means, through different media, through engagement like this. So we're going to do our best to keep listening, right, and keep hearing the really good suggestions that are coming from the community about how to reach the most people about this plan that we possibly can. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm breaking the rules. I'm just going to do this. Garfield parents. I understand even the state when they were in the community and so forth, so I get that. Um, my question is I'm concerned that we can't get the community involved. Um, and in fact, I don't think that we can make it happen. More than the education of students, and I apologize in advance if I'm not clear, I 
don't make the assumption that you, oh, we're going to invest in new development because then we'll assume that you're going to care about that. So, but that means that you should never have made an assumption that we're going to start using all this debt and all this debt. When are we going to start using all this new development and all this, the alternative? Or if I don't have a bike, how can I get one? How can I, I, I tell my wife is more comfortable with that than I am. Um, I'm always there for my son to get him home and get him to the spectrum, and he's got to get to the spectrum to get home. You know, I'm thankful that he doesn't have to get the tag in the car. So when we look at those things, we have to make sure that we're clear that we don't make those assumptions because we have to work. We do depend on other people to help us make those assumptions and to make those assumptions that we have faith in our ability to make those assumptions. That is, I, I, I absolutely imagine. I think that regardless of, of the outcome of this referendum, I think that is something that we need to continue discussing because currently we have um, students from all over town going through all five of our, our um, school boards. So the, the walkability, the accessibility um, questions, the questions regardless of, of the outcome of the yeah. referendum. Yeah, one thing we've been saying to one another is that kind of a question doesn't have to wait until right. fall 2027. So it's um, important to think I'm Adrian Earl. Um, I have, I think, two quick questions. Um, one is um, just to preface, like, um, I wasn't surprised about with the bond referendum being about good chapter, but I was, I think, like many of us, <laughs> totally blindsided about the closing of the schools, and I, I hear all the explanations as to why that has to be part of it. My question um, was, when was that decision made for, um, that, because I know this has been worked on for years, but it's a process, like, when was the decision made that it was going to be schools would close and Sharp and Garfield would be closed? Um, and then my second question, um, to, to be quick with that, is since it's been mentioned that Garfield will be sold and there have been a no number of things that have been mentioned, like the renovation of Sharp to become a community center, um, possibly using that money to fund phase one, two schools, possibly using that money to um, fund renovations at Newby and other schools. Um, how much do we think we're looking for to get for Garfield? Those are my two questions. I, I mean, I can say in terms of we started engaging in 2022 about Gar about um, Green Shepherd. At that time, we didn't fully realize what was going to happen with the Shepherd High School. I think that has really been something that we've been sitting with as we face into January um, and how this change. This change. How do we actually that information? How do we decide where we're going to go with the community plan and how we lay it out and make sure that we can work with the staff to make sure that those information is part of our, our update. Um, that was some of the, the reasons why we began to engage with them from then to now. So here we are. Um, in terms of purchase, I, 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 I I'll, I'm not, maybe not the best. I think, and so in terms of, of purchase, um, it all hinges on once we have an affirmative response in September, mm -hmm. um, it would then be um, the district's responsibility to bring in professionals that can help assess what the actual value is um, and then to help facilitate um, the sale. The sale. Um, and the sale of the commercial property is a little bit different than residential, and so we need to make sure that that is Thank you. So you have another question, but given that we're after time um, and everyone got to ask a question, I'm not going to get into second question. Uh, trying to clarify the few questions that I've asked as this process has gone on. Is it the position of the board that Good Shepherd hadn't been available, we wouldn't be speaking. And we are in the schematic phase, I think you called it. So although we have some figures, we don't have access to any actual figures. And then if somebody tries to project what is going on in the future, like what we will do here, here, and here, those are hypotheticals. But we don't have any answers to exactly what's going to happen 100% when you get these buildings. So isn't this plan sort of hypothetical? And it seems like 
we are trying to get like simple details. And then I asked like last time, how did the engineer come to the cost of what Sark was going to do? Well, it cost the you know difference between turning it into a rec center and approving it uh, with the uh, ADA or whatever. Let me let them an let's let them answer those. So in answer to your first question, so when the Good Shepherd unfortunately closed during the pandemic, that created an opportunity that we did not have. And so let's be just very clear. The Good Shepherd is almost 45,000 square feet. To build the Good Shepherd in Collingswood in 2024, we're looking at 75 to $80 million. Completely unaffordable. No way that we have that level of ability as a school district. When we began discussing in a good faith efforts with, an, with the ad hoc facilities committee, trying to address some of the issues that have been presented for many, many years by our community about the absence of usable educational space, we did not have an answer in 2021 until the Good Shepherd became available. And so when we began engaging in discussions, uh, it took roughly nine months of negotiation in order to actually get to a viable um, um, agreement with the diocese. And then we began the process of thinking about uh, how do we not only purchase the building, we didn't want a building that would just sit vacant, but also uh, we wanted to be able to come back to our community with our buildings and baths. And so in September of 2022, we made the public announcement uh, in a, a virtual meeting because we were still under some of the COVID restrictions of our intent to purchase the Good Shepherd, but making sure that we did not make the errors from the 2017-2018 referendum by having a, an unaligned request for the community to consider. In terms of our architects and our engineers, as we shared a little bit earlier, we asked a simple question. What can we do to add additional space in every building in our inventory? And so that took six to, to eight months for them to do the analysis through the architects and the engineers to assess and determine what could be or could not be done in each and every building and what was the estimated cost based on um, industry expectations at that particular time. And so that's what we've been working off of. And so when we talk about hypotheticals, and so to be able to answer one of the questions that was asked, we received enrollment projections year over year in December and January for that upcoming school year. And so when we're talking about who we're going to have, what their academic needs are going to be for September of 2027, we won't have that information until January or, or December of 2027. And so it's not that we don't have a rough estimate of numbers, but numbers don't tell the full story of what our children need. So if we have children that have significant academic needs as determined by the data, their IEP, or new families that move in, um, we have to be responsive to that. And so in answer to your question in, in terms of hypotheticals, we are using the, the information that we have available to us from our professionals, from our architects, our engineers, our building specialists about what we can do with our buildings. But your, the crux of your initial question was, is that if there were no good shepherd, would we be here? No, we would not be here. Thank you, Sue. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. McDowell and Reagan to maybe share out next steps and what po folks can expect post this evening. Um, and then we will make sure that everyone um, can get here. So thank you once again to everyone for coming out um, on another Tuesday night uh, to listen to all of this. And um, we appreciate the engagement. And we've gotten some really good feedback about things that we can add to um, our list of things to do as well as to the website. So that is one of the things that you can look um, for down the line, as well as more uh, informal information sessions uh, that are uh, for smaller groups, um, not with microphones and things like that, um, as well as then once Or me. Or, right. Or Julia's facilitator, even though she's done a wonderful job. Um, yes. Um, and volunteered her time uh, for, for it. Uh, in addition, as Bruce said, we'll have some uh, events for seniors to make sure that they are aware of the tax impact and what they could potentially do to offset some of that. And there will be uh, 
hopefully uh, some community members, maybe some of the ones that came up to ask about it, who will help to engage more with um, various members of the community to make sure that uh, information is getting out to the largest amount of people possible. And then closer to the, uh, the actual vote, um, there will be a much more robust information campaign um, that will go out with uh, mailings and uh, even more information on a website. We'll have more information to be able to give you closer to, to the actual vote than we have now because as, as Matt had said, we wanted folks to have this information to process earlier rather than later, but there's still quite a bit of time until the actual vote and uh, quite a bit that we still need to hear back from the state about. Um, am I missing anything? So, no, I just, I, I just wanted to publicly thank all of the uh, community members that are currently in attendance, those that are watching online or will watch uh, on YouTube. Um, the one thing that connects all of us is that we love and we care about this community and we love and care about our children. And so that's the thing that brings us all together. And so I would just encourage us to continue having conversations about the how we do that um, with that single-minded focus and what are we uh, uh, seeking to build for the future of our kids of our community the place that we've all moved here intentionally the place that we love and so keeping in mind that everyone in this conversation um, has value and so we want to make sure that we're honoring all of those uh, pieces of feedback as we move forward and so there are going to be continued opportunities for us to engage in smaller, more intimate settings that are more aligned with having authentic conversations. And so please stay tuned. So thank you for this evening.